Hello, is it working? Well, hello everyone, thank you for, for attending my talk. As you said, my name is Julia, you can contact me on those social accounts. And I work at this little startup called Big Out in Spain. So what we're talking about this morning uh, is I'm telling you the story on why I decided to package my client application as a binary, uh, how I did it and the implications I found on the way. Uh, so let's start in the beginning. It's April 2013. We just have finished our prototype of our application, entirely written in Java. Uh, we have this new smart engineer on board who's also very brave because first thing he does as he joined us is try to convince the CTO to move into Python. And he provided very rock solid arguments on why we should do that. Uh, but the CTO wasn't entirely convinced because Python, even if you only distribute the PyC files, well, it's very easy to, it's very easy to, to decompile and the investors wouldn't be happy with that and blah, blah, blah. But I was hating Maven at the moment, slow as hell. And I also wanted to move into Python. So I said, well, then. Just let me do some research on the thing. And I really thought it would only take me a couple of minutes at Google to find a solution for our problem. And I went and typed obfuscate Python. And you can laugh at me if you want to. Uh, because the answers I found weren't at all answers. They were on this this kind of, well, Python is not the tool you need, it wasn't designed that way, it's against its philosophy, um, plus everything that's ever been written in Python ever, it's open source, and if you wanna do it anyway, it's really hard, and even if you, if even real compiles applications can be reverse engineered, and well, they hack Windows all the time, so they will hack your application too. Uh, well, quit your job. If your company is trying to do such an unethical stuff, you should quit your company right now. Um, code protection is overrated. Um, yes, writing a legal, a legal requirement should be enough. Well, for me, that's just a bunch of excuses uh, and lies. I mean, Dropbox, originally, I don't know if you still do that, but it was written in Python and was obfuscated. And yeah, they, they, they hacked it, uh, and they hacked Windows, yes. But I wish, I wish our application has such many people trying to hack it as Windows and Dropbox have. So you are telling me I'm trying to do something that that's not possible that I cannot do whatever I want with my own code because people don't do that and because it's hard, really. In my previous company, they'd have a compiled PHP into C, so that's not going to stop me. I, I now want to do it, per I took it personally. I just want to do it as an intellectual exercise. I wanna discover if I'm capable of doing this. So, uh, the statements I wrote before weren't everything I found. There was a guy suggesting that maybe you could try to use Cyton to compile your Python code into C code and then go on. So, that's where I started. So this is the process I came uh, out with. First step is to take your Python code and compile it with, um, and convert it to C code uh, with Cyton. Then you compile it with the setup. Then you need to package it and create a, an actual executable thing. And I used the installer for that. 
Uh, with pin styler, you get a folder with everything you need, uh, executable and all the external dependencies you may have. Uh, and you can take that folder and pass it to any auto-installer software for your system. I mean, Debian packages uh, set up for Windows, DMG packages for Mac. Um, well, the, this is how everything is done. Converting your Python code into C code is actually really easy. Uh, well, I don't know if you can read the code, but what we're doing here is walking through our source tree directory and replicate it into a new folder because you probably don't want your C files be, to be placed just by your Python files. Uh, so on every Python file, you call a uh, Cytonize method, um, which is cool is you can tell Cyton not to force compilation. So if a file has not changed, it won't reconvert it again, which saves you a lot of time. Um, well, that, that's all. Now that you have your C files, uh, it's where things become a little nasty and hacky and obscure. I haven't found a way to actually tell uh, sysconfig which uh, compiling flags do I have. They seem to be stored in a static dictionary that's uh, created first time you call sysconfig.getconfig bar. And what happens in there is you don't know which entries of the dictionary are being used really, and some of the flags are uh, duplicated uh, along various entries. So this is trial and error mostly. Uh, first thing, what we're doing here is uh, walk our new source tree of C files and creating an extension for, for every C file. Um, this uh, thing involved in here, the Pyrex without assertions, is to disable assertions because you probably don't want assertions in production. And then for different plat platforms, you have to override the flags you don't want. And what it happens is that for Unix systems, uh, extensions are compiled with debugging symbols in them that makes uh, your compiled application uh, bigger and slower, so you probably want to disable them. And um, then three days ago, uh, ago, I discovered that in one of our Mac machines, uh, it, uh, traces were enabled by default, but the, in the other one, they weren't. I just discovered it, so I had to add this new override here. But once you're finished hacking your sysconfig configuration, uh, you just need to call setup with your array of extensions. And everything gets compiled. So now you have your Python application uh, compiled as a native extension, but you still depend on some external libraries, probably. So you want to pack it all together. <laughs> And as I said before, we are using, using pinstaller for this. Um, what uh, we are doing, as we have, we had some problems with external dependencies with pinstaller, is uh, we created a fake main file which imports the real native extension main file and all the third party stuff. Uh, because sometimes you need to explicitly import submodules. Well, this is also a bit of trial and error. Uh, so first thing Pinstaller does uh, is create, uh, you pass this file to it, and it creates a specification file, uh, which you can configure a bit, so you can tell what you, where your binary contents are. So we are telling here first line to include images, and then some external modules like this, Mimer, uh, it contains binary files in it. So mm, I just 
telling the installer to copy, uh, to copy the, whole, the whole directory. Um, I had some problems with crypto in some machines, so yeah, I, the same. I did the same. I told the installer to copy the whole thing into my project. Um, well, that, that's all. You, you get a folder with an executable file. You can copy your client machine, preferably going through a standard way of doing that. But that, that's most, mostly all. Um, well, ha have I achieved my goal of sec uh, security improvement? Well, uh, with uh, Pinstaller, you can package your application uh, into different ways. You can package it uh, as a single big file or as a folder which contains everything. The problem with the single big file is that uh, it's compressed and everything, every time you execute it, it needs to uncompress itself into a temporary file which works great for graphical interface applications but it's really slow for um, common line application as is our case. Um, so it's really easy for hackers to discover it's Python because if you package your application as a folder, they are, they are seeing all the files in there and they could recognize stuff. But even if uh, you package it all together, you can execute your application uh, within a program that will print you every assembly line, sometimes with an extra help like this thing in there. So everyone would recognize that that's running Python on the inside. Um, well, can the reverse engineer you with that? Probably they can import your native extensions and invoke your methods to discover what they are doing, but they cannot actually see the code. Um, they even have help, because if you didn't tell Cyton not to, uh, Cyton by default we'd, will include the doc strings of your methods. But well, it's safer than not doing anything. Other implications uh, you may ask, uh, it has, well, I'm using C, so is this any more efficient than, than running just the Python code? So I did a little benchmark, uh, but first I need to explain what uh, our project does. What a uh, B-Code project does is uh, take a C++ project, C, uh, tree source, and analyze it, uh, discovering all the interconnections among the files in the project and the external projects you may be using. So it's a CPO bound processing. So this uh, benchmark I did uh, on the X axis, uh, I have the number of files in your C++ project, while on the Y axis I have a time to process them, just processing time, not reading from disk, obviously. So what happens is that for small projects or medium-sized projects, like under 500 files, uh, efficiency gain in time is around 7%, which itself is not bad. But for really, really big projects, and this one, uh, last, this last one is SDL, SDL library, which has over 2,000 files, efficiency gain was of three seconds, which for from user experience perspective, it's a lot. And it's a 32% time uh, gain. So I think overall, the process wasn't hard, wasn't difficult, and we gained something in the way. So I think <laughs> there was the reaction on the internet wasn't good enough. So, well, time for... Did you change your Python code or did you just use it as is with the Python? I use it as is. Uh, I have more time for questions.
questions. And if you want to read in more detail about all this process, I have a series of blog posts. Ah, sorry. I have a series of blog posts uh, written with uh, wider uh, snippets of code. I will put this on the internet later so you can go and read them. Uh, so, time for more questions. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Do you think it's important to cytonize the entire application, or would it be sufficient to cytonize only the kernel, the stuff that you do differently from others, and leave everything else in Python? And on a related note, how do you debug this stuff? Uh, could you raise your hand, because I'm hearing you on my back. Ah, OK. <laughs> um, well, uh, as it isn't difficult at all to cytonize the application, um, I don't mind uh, cytonizing it all or just the processing part. Uh, how do I debug it? It's in Python. I have uh, I, I run my tests in Python. Uh, I can set the debugging level even when I'm running this uh, cytonized application, so I can see all the traces. Uh, so I've never, I've never found a problem I cannot solve running the application just with Python. I, uh, if you've already done this, then I assume you're happy with it, especially with the extra performance. But when you were doing your research, did you consider writing a custom loader and maybe taking the Marshall module and hacking it up so that everything looks different and sort of obfuscating that way? I preferred to use something that was already there and working because I knew that I would probably would write more bugs than useful stuff if I tried to write my own obfuscator. So uh, as this worked, first time I tried it, uh, I stuck with it. Um, so I saw that you uh, called the siphonize function manually, but uh, probably know that uh, there is an extension f for the extension object that, uh, that automatically does the siphonizing part for you, so you can actually pass the, the PYX file to the extension. Is there any reason you did it that way, or? No, uh, uh. this is the point I started and I okay. built on, so probably the process can be improved a mm. lot. Uh, I don't know if calling the extension directly would allow you this not non-compiling again stuff. Probably it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. So mm. now there isn't a reason for that. Mm. Yeah. But, but I, because I, uh, I had a, uh, an extension written in Cypher as well, and in, I think the way you can pass the compiler options uh, is a, is nicer when you do it uh, through the extension object. So. Uh, yeah, but the yeah. compiler option, options I'm hacking here are, are mm -hmm. to the extension library. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm calling extension, mm -hmm. then I'm setting up the options, and finally I'm calling setup. Okay. So there is no site on involved anymore at that stage. Yeah. Um, so um, what you're saying is that extension chooses some compiler flags by default, which you don't want, and you mm -hmm. have to remove them. OK. Yes. Thanks. Any more questions? <laughs> Any more questions at all? Um, can I ask a question? Hmm? What's the implication for testing if you have a um, binary rather than your? Well, uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, yeah, sorry. What's the implication for testing with the binary and the, uh, are you having to test it all twice? No, because as I said before, I've never <coughs> met that there's a bug that happens only with the binary application and not with the Python. We, we ran some uh, upset, uh, I don't know, final test uh, with the binary, just to be sure, but the, the big suit of tests is run against the Python code. Excellent. Any more? No? Well, thank you very much, Julia. Thank you.